Hello, kiddos. Look what we've got. We've got the Atari 800 back on the bench, and we're going to get some better video output out of it today. Take a look. What you're seeing here is crystal clear HDMI upscaled video with nice vibrant colors. And it's all thanks to this guy. So just who is Copper Dragon and what does he have to do with getting pixel perfect vibrant HDMI out of my 43 year old Atari 800? Copper Dragon is a very bright bulb who lives in Austria. I don't know much about Austria, and I can only think of a couple people who came from there. There's Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, and one other guy who I don't really want to talk about after the kerfuffle he caused back in the 1930s. But Copper Dragon is a name many of you probably already know. If you've been around the retro computing community for any length of time, you've probably encountered, or at least heard of, one of his many projects and contributions. If you want to see what he's been up to over the years, just check out his GitHub repositories using the link below. Well, he's been at it again, and this time he's come up with something that's pure genius, LumaCode. LumaCode is a new way of encoding digital video data as an analog signal that can then be processed by an upscaling device such as the RGB to HDMI with proper hardware and programming to interpret such data and reproduce the image exactly as the source computer intended it. What will really surprise you is that this encoded data requires only a single signal ground pair to transmit its information. Copper Dragon has designed small interposer boards he calls digitizers or dizers that sit between the chip producing the digital video signal and the motherboard of the computer in question. This board uses a specially programmed FPGA IC or field programmable gate array to intercept these digital video signals and output an analog voltage level for communication with the upscaler. Each sample can have one of four voltage levels, five if you count the 0.0, .0 volt sync tip, which represent two binary digits. Binary 00, 0 is 0 0.31 volts, 0 01 is 0 0.53 volts, 10 is 0 0.74 volts, and 1-1 one one is 0 0.96 volts. That would be enough to transfer color data for a pixel on a computer with a four color palette. However, the bits of multiple sample points can be joined, high bit first, into a longer binary number to represent the color of a pixel on a computer with more than four colors. As an example, the Commodore 64 has a 16 color palette and therefore requires two samples or four bits to reproduce a pixel. The Atari 800, with a GTIA, can produce up to 256 colors on screen simultaneously and therefore requires four samples or eight bits. The upscaler, in this case an RGB to HDMI equipped with the analog daughter board, receives this analog signal and then, using a comparator on the analog board, converts the voltage levels back to binary digital information that it then uses to reproduce the video and output it to HDMI. This can be done for a myriad of video chips, and Copper Dragon has designed his interposer boards for many already. You've just seen the GTIA digitizer at work. This board will work on all Atari 8-bit machines that use the GTIA chip. It may also work on the earlier CTIA, since they were pin compatible and produced similar output, but I don't know of anyone who's tried that yet. Commodore is also well represented. The VIC-2 dizer works with the VIC-2 chip in the C64. This version is capable of auto-detecting the type of VIC-2 chip you're using, with the exception of the early 6567R56A variant, in which case you need to request a special firmware when ordering, and works with either NTSC or PAL machines. I'll be installing one of those later in this video. I've heard that there may be some issues using this in conjunction with the VIC-2 Kawari, but I haven't tried that, so I can't confirm. You'd only need it with the small Kawari, as the large board produces its own DVI HDMI output. The VIC-2 Dizer 128 will work with all known variations of the VIC-2E in the Commodore 128. Copper Dragon designed the board in a form factor to fit all known C128 mainboards. 
There is a known incompatibility with certain games that use the 2 MHz hack to speed up computations. The VIC digitizer, designed to be used with the PAL 6561 VIC chip, has been available for some time, but Copper Dragon lacked an NTSC 6560 chip to reverse engineer to produce an NTSC version until recently. That's where little old me comes in. I got to play a teeny tiny part in his genius by providing him the chip he needed to complete the NTSC VIC digitizer. At the time of this recording, he hasn't added the NTSC compatible version to his Tendi store, but he promises that those will be coming soon. I'll also be installing the prototype he provided me into a VIC-20 later in the video. A TIA digitizer is available to provide LumaCode output from an Atari 2600. I've got that one on order as, at the time of recording, it just came back in stock on his Tendi store. There's a ULA digitizer for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. This one's a little different due to space constraints inside the Spectrum case. It mounts to the bottom of the motherboard and does require some soldering to install. And finally, at least at the time of this recording, there's the TMS digitizer. I'm waiting to get my hands on this one as it's currently out of stock. This one works with the TMS 9918A, TMS 9928A, and TMS 9929A graphics chips, making it compatible with several platforms such as the ColecoVision, most MSX computers, and the Texas Instruments TI-99 4A. It should work with both the NTSC and PAL variants. Copper Dragon has gone out of his way to make these easy to install, requiring in most cases little to no soldering. Let's see how easy it is to install the VIC-2 Dizer and the VIC Digitizer in a C64 and VIC-20 respectively. This board is meant to simply plug into the socket that the GTIA is in, and then the GTIA plugs into this socket on top. A small connection, two pins, comes off this and goes out to an HDMI upscaler, such as the RGB to HDMI, that has the proper code for converting the signals that are produced by the LumaCode board into HDMI video. Copper Dragon has designed most of these boards uh, intending them to be solderless. So the greatest ease of installation that he could manage. This particular instance, um, the GTIA, if I were using a later model Atari 800, one of the XL series or possibly XE series, uh, then there would be space available to install it the way he intended, plugged into the socket. Unfortunately, with the original 800, the rather massive uh, cast aluminum shell, the CPU board, which is the board that contains the CPU, the Antic, and the GTIA, um, it fits into this compartment, and that is too narrow for the socket plus the, plus the GTIA digitizer. Um, to fit into, so it had to be soldered directly to the board. I would have had to replace the socket at the very least because the uh, machined pins on the back of this board uh, wouldn't fit into the socket that was populated on this board to begin with. Those sockets have very narrow openings for the chip legs and the rounded machined pins wouldn't fit into it. So the to uh, accomplish this on this machine, I had to remove the socket and solder the GTIA digitizer directly onto the motherboard or onto the uh, CPU board. Um, when doing this, I went ahead, I don't think there was going to be an issue, but I put some Kapton tape on the bottom side of this board just to make sure that nothing shorted out underneath. I also put some Kapton tape over here to stop these connections from touching anything. Another thing that had to be done for this board because of the necessary removal of the socket was there's a resistor right here and a resistor here that had to be moved to the back of the board for the GTIA digitizer to fit. You can see those here and here. 
also because of the depth I had to remove, there were three styrofoam uh, pads that kept the back of the CPU board from touching the uh, cast aluminum shell and shorting out. So I re I pulled those off to re you know to reduce the thickness, and then I used Kapton tape on the back to prevent uh, prevent the shorting of the board to the aluminum shell. So once that's in place, then we simply put the GTIA back in. Uh, when you're working with these, always make sure that you're careful of the notch. Uh, the notch on the CPU board here, uh, the notches for all the chips face the connector, and that's the case, and that's how we soldered in the GTIA digitizer. And then the, the uh, GTIA simply sockets or slots back into the socket. I say simply. Uh, the pins are not quite aligned right. And you just want to make sure that you don't bend any of the pins when you put that in there. Okay. And then you're going to have a cable. Um, and I had to make a special cable for this uh, because of how this works in the original 800. You're going to see two pins coming off the GTIA digitizer. The pin closest to the notch of the chip is going to be your uh, signal, and the pin farthest away is going to be your ground. So if you make your own cable, uh, the pins did have to be lifted a little bit so that it would clear the antic chip. And then once we have that, oh, wait, sorry. No, can't do it that way. First, we slot the, slot the uh, CPU board back into the 800 uh, because with this shell, we need to have a way to get the connector outside the shell. So the shell in the 800 does have a hole here pre-drilled in it. I don't know what that was originally for, but it comes in very handy here. This little connector, I used a smaller connector than the one that Copper Dragon provided. We'll slip right through there. And then we take that and we mount it, as I said, with the signal toward the bottom or the, toward the pin one of the chip and then feed that through the hole and fit that back, fit the shell back onto the 800. Now, next thing is we need to give the 800 its power and AV board back, even though we're not using the AV part of it, we do need the power. Uh, so that fits here. And then this connector goes here. And the next thing we need is an upscaler. So I have here an RGB to HDMI. This one contains the analog um, sandwich board, interposer board. So you get the six pin uh, analog connection. And you can, uh, you can buy these cables from Copper Dragon on his Tendi store. And you're going to connect that cable into the little pigtail that's coming off the GTIA digitizer and coming out of the A800. Connect that there. Now, because the RGB to HDMI doesn't handle audio, I'm also uh, using an audio injector for HDMI, and I'm taking the audio for that for that off of the standard AI. Um, port and I built a little cable to connect over right now that is uh, mono it's on the left channel only but I've got a, a better adapter coming um, that'll give me stereo stereo mono two channel mono and that should be enough to hook this up now when I put this together or back together in the case I will use this the uh, strain reliefs back here on the back of the shell 
and then this cable will simply stick out through the hole in the shell where the RF cable used to come out. Since we no longer have that connected, we can use that hole for this. And if I give you the output back. Now, um, when working with the original 800s, you have to remember that the door switch needs to be pushed down for power to work. So I've got tape on the door switch here. And we have the Defender cartridge in. And there it is. So we can put this into demo mode. And there you go. Crystal clear, pixel perfect HDMI with vibrant colors out of the original Atari 800 machine. Designed in 1979, and this one, this particular one, was manufactured in 1992. So, that is the first of the Lumico digitizers that I'll show you today. So, we're going to go ahead and uh, get the Atari down off the, off the platform here, put back together, and then we'll move on with the Commodore 64. If you've been enjoying this video, go ahead and give it a like. Leave me a comment down below. And if you haven't already, please go ahead and smash that subscribe button and click the notification bell if you'd like to be alerted when I post new videos. Thanks. Now back to the digitizers. All right. Let's see how easy it is to install a LumaCode board onto a Commodore 64. This is one of the machines from the last uh, live stream that I did. So it's working. We're going to go ahead and make sure that it's working. I have it plugged in. I have it going to the video here. So we'll turn it on. And it is still a working machine. So we're good there. Okay, now the next thing we need to do is get the RGB to HDMI set up in the proper profile. So we'll bring up the menu. There we go. Come down to the profile here. And we need to switch it to the Commodore 64 Luma code, which is right there. And then we can get about adding in the Luma code device. I'm knocking everything everywhere. What we're gonna do with this one, since we're not going to be using RF out anymore is we will go ahead and repurpose the RF modulators RCA jack. I am just knocking everything everywhere here. Okay. Oh, this is an R56A. I'm going to need to grab a different VIC 2 because my dizer won't work with the R56A. Okay, and here is our VIC-2 dizer that we're going to be installing. Now, all we need to do is put the dizer into the socket. We have our VIC-2 dizer, and we have it fitted into a socket because there's a uh, variable variable resistor here, a potentiometer that adjusts some of the signaling uh, levels. Uh, so we need to have a little socket to give it a little more height. And then we put our VIC-2 into our dizer, get it to fit. And finally, our dizer. our dizer into our VIC-2 socket. There we go. And now what we're going to do is we're going to repurpose the RCA jack and the RF modulator. And to do that, we need to clip its existing connection.
make sure that's bent out of the way so it's not touching. And then we simply use our included cable. And I believe the way it's going to go is green is going to go to signal here. And then we just need to hook ground to anywhere there's ground. And that should give us an output for the dizer. Plug in our RCA cable. And with the RGB to HDMI already configured, And there we go. We have pixel perfect HDMI coming out of a C64 with what, less than five minutes work. So um, what I could do to make this more permanent, I could go ahead and change this cable out and uh, solder directly to the RCA jack on, on inside the RF modulator since we're not gonna be using RF anymore with this. Um, also, I have got sound working, theoretically, so let me make a little adaptation here, uh, get our video and our, our audio out. It's got video out on it too, but I'm only using the audio here. Uh, this is going into, as, be as before, with the, with the Atari 800, I, I've got it hooked to the HDMI audio injector. And so that you can see the full result, we will go ahead and uh, load our Easy Flash cartridge. Got a joystick hooked up, and we can go to the screen now, and you can see how clear that picture is. It's very clear, very vibrant, very beautiful picture. And we can go, oops. Games. see Frogger, you can at least see the, the movement on the screen and the clear uh, video. But you can see how clear that comes out and how easy that was to install. So I'm going to go ahead and move the C64 off the board and we'll take a look at a VIC-20. Okay, we have a VIC-20 here. Now the VIC-20 has a little bit of an extra challenge in that it has no RCA output. What I'm gonna do, as it comes from Copper Dragon, the VIC-20 digitizer has this RCA uh, panel mount jack attached to it. Um, I'm just gonna leave this hanging for now, just to show you that it works. But if I were to actually be installing this uh, long-term in this machine, what I think I would do uh, since I don't like to do case modifications, is what I would do would be to remove this uh, jack panel from the side of the board, and I would 3D print a replacement and add a hole somewhere on here, probably over here, to, to panel mount that RCA jack. And then the connection would be over here. I wouldn't have damaged any of the original case. Um, any future owner could put it back to stock by simply replacing the original panel and I wouldn't have done any harm. But like I said, for now, I'm just going to hook it up uh, and leave this floating. Okay, and that is socketed, so we're good. You must remember that the notch goes to the right as you're gonna put it in the digitizer in the correct way. Now let's see if we're going to run into any mounting problems.
Hmm. Yeah, it looks like it's not going to mount. Oh, maybe it will. Just mount in with the can still around it. Okay, I think that's in the socket. And we've got the notch the right direction. And we take the 6560 and put it into the digitizer. Looks like no bent pins. So that actually should be all there is to it. We'll put this in for audio. And then we will attach the RGB to HDMI. And I have the penultimate cartridge here we'll put in. And you have the joystick. And let's see if we got it. Well, we got, uh -huh, looks like we might have a problem with the VIC-20. Let's try it without the penultimate cartridge. Let's see what we get. Yeah, it's working without the penultimate. Oh, it was. Hmm. Well, it looks like the video is working just fine. Uh, my penultimate cartridge isn't working well with this machine. Now, that could be just a bad or a dirty uh, cartridge connector, but we'll check here. This is the uh, VIC-20 dead test that's uh, preloaded onto the penultimate plus cartridge. Let's try getting back into the main cartridge again. Not sure what's causing that. But here's a mega race. And we need the keyboard. <laughs> Okay, you can see it. Very clear, very crisp HDMI. And that's how easy it is to install uh, Copper Dragon's digitizer boards. Very simple, very easy. Again, with the VIC-20, there would be a little bit of additional work because I'd need to mount the RCA jack somewhere, whether it be, you know, to the case itself, which I would hate to do because I don't like to modify cases. Or if I 3D print one of these panels, uh, I can mount it to that. So um, that's all there is to it. And so that'll do it for today. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and give it a like. 
If not, you know what to do there too. If you haven't already, please go ahead and click the subscribe button. And uh, if you want to be alerted when I post new videos, you can click the notification bell and get some options for how you can be alerted or how often you're alerted. Please leave a comment in the comment section below. I love hearing from you guys. I love interacting with you guys. It's a big part of the reason that I do this at all, that I can connect with folks out there in the retro community. And uh, I love your comments, both positive and negative. Uh, I know I screw things up a lot, so <laughs> I'll take the criticism with the compliments. Or if you just want to say hi, that's fine. You can share the video out to your friends or to social media. I'd appreciate that. That gets it out to a wider audience. And I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters. Their names are showing up on the screen now. Uh, you guys really mean a lot to me, so I appreciate that. Uh, if you, too, would like to support the channel, there are several ways you can do that. You can join the channel, and that would be by clicking the Join button down below here. You can become a Patreon supporter. Um, the link for that is on the screen. You can also go to Ko-Fi to support me. The link for that is on the screen. I think that's all I have to tell you. So, everybody, um, have a happy new year. This should be coming out either on or near New Year's Day. I uh, hope you have a happy and safe holiday and, and uh, everything goes well for you. And I hope you have a great 2024. I'm going to try myself. And that'll do it. But stay safe, stay well, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Have a great week. Bye.